welcome to Clothing Culture. I'm Emily Lane. I'm Brett Schnetker. We speak with experts where we explore the global dynamics that shape trends in the fashion industry. Brought to you by Stars Design Group, a global production and design house with over 30 years of industry experience. Welcome back to another episode of Clothing Culture. Today, we are going to be exploring the woven fabric of global business and fashion. Brett, welcome back. Thank you. Glad to have another conversation with you on this really timely topic. Yeah, definitely. You know, it it really, you know, politics have been shaping conversations uh, in a very heated way um, for some time. I, I Certainly suspect over forever, the last four but, years, maybe forever, but pretty pretty much a lot more engaging over the last four years. Absolutely, and even at the office, uh, yeah, we're for sure. constantly finding ourselves entrenched in debate and conversation, which is really healthy. I think it's important to foster these conversations. But you know, it, really talking about the impact that fashion or uh, politics have had in the fashion industry. You know, over recent years, sure. it's it's uh, quite an interesting topic to explore. Definitely, I think you know when you look at politics, I don't think politics has ever been more divisive. You know, politics at its heart is a unique construct, right? And I think then when we look at what's happened recently, what's happened over the few year, you know, over the last number of years, um, we have to ask ourselves. Is the direction that politics going healthy for us as Americans or us as global citizens? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's probably a lot of evidence to suggest that there needs to be a new way, right. a new way to look at at you know how we think of um, our politicians, some of our politicians, mm -hmm. and how we construct um, uh, a return to politician as a civil, ser a civil servant, um, a return to someone that you believe has the best interests of America at heart. You mentioned you know, being you know, a citizen um, of the world. And yeah. we talk a lot about you know, being a global company, being globalist, and you know, the fashion economy is a global economy. It is. Um, what are some observations of, of things that you've seen over the last several years? Uh, how, some of those decisions and some of the various things that have had an impact on the global nature of this industry. Yeah, I think, you know, um, nationalism to me in its current framework um, that has crept up in a number of countries, um, one, it's probably not a super intelligent construct. I mean, we are a connected world. Mm -hmm. You can't go back. And certainly in America, thinking that we can separate ourselves from the world, one, is a very dangerous conversation because our economy depends on a robust trade, but two, we have no infrastructure to support it, nor would we have an infrastructure. And, you know, I think one, uh, you know, that in itself has been troubling me for a long time. I mean, America has been a leading light in the world, therefore being a leading light, the currency in which the world trades mm -hmm. with is the United States currency. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that, but one of the main reasons is America has been a global leader. Two, brands. Mm -hmm. You know, in news there, we talk about what our exports are and what are our chief exports. And, you know, the big ones are airplanes from Boeing or we're the breadbasket of the world. Those are pretty understandable. But in traveling the world, one of the things that I think exists that we don't talk about so much are our brands. Mm -hmm. It is the, the, I don't know, the, the development of the American way that comes through these brands that, um, that the world has embraced. Right. Our, one of our number one exports in my mind is our brands. Everything from Hollywood, Disney to Starbucks and Coca-Cola. It seems so second nature. Second nature to us. Mm -hmm. But when you travel, I remember being in Pokhara, Nepal, and this is really literally in the middle of subtropical Himalayas. And 
I would go there to escape occasionally, and there's this beautiful lake. You stay on this little island lodge called the King's Island, and you can take boat rides out onto the lake, and they've got a Buddhist temple, and the chants come over the water at night. Just a very peaceful, idyllic place uh, in the Himalayas. And I remember, I, I thought it was incredible, in the middle of this nowhere place that would have literally no economic impact uh, to any degree, there was this trade war going on between Pepsi and Coke. <laughs> and they would pay, I don't know how much, you know, whatever, so many rupees or whatever, um, uh, Nepalese dollars, I don't remember the currency at the time, but um, to have the the boat, the boat, you know, the boat captains, yeah. they were, you know, rowboats or whatever, <laughs> paint the side of their boats with Coca-Cola. And then the next day, some other group would come and pay them a little more to repaint it with mm -hmm. Pepsi Cola. And I thought, what an interesting concept that our branding had had gone so deep into right. some of these very, very rural places. The middle of a very small yeah, peaceful trade village. Yeah, in the middle right? of nowhere. Yeah, in the, in the Himalayas. So. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, and, and and like you mentioned, we we don't really think about it. You know, mm -hmm. I always, I always, have a dialogue about our brands and I talk that, you know, you go into the grocery store and, you know, you go to the garbage bag section. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the, one of the most base products in the world. Right. Branding should really have no relevance. You're putting garbage and you're throwing it away. And we're all intelligent people. Most of us, we can read the sides and, you know, you read the mill, Mm -hmm. uh, the mill weight of the plastic. You see yeah. that the constructions are the same and there's a no-name brand sitting next to Hefty. But some are heftier, right? What the <laughs> hell? We end up buying Hefty over this oh, no-name brand. Don't want your Even garbage though to fall out everywhere. That's our good brain branding. knows <laughs> they're the same. Right. And I think that that is this um, evidence that that we have developed a real sophistication for branding, that the rest of the world that many parts in in the rest of the world, there are certainly European countries that really get branding really well. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in our business, some of the most exclusive brands in the world come out of, out of you know Europe. the EU and Europe. Right. Um, and so, uh, but I think for Asian nations, etc., this is a relatively new concept. They 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 have their own form of advertisement as you travel, but they've never developed these global brands like America has. And I think, you know, if we think we want to back away from the rest of the world, we don't want to continue to be what America has been, we have to understand the ramification. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the ramifications could be damage to our economy in that way. And talking about being a part of this global economy, um, Often you have, in previous conversations on our podcast, you've talked about America having abandoned manufacturing many years ago. Sure. How can America benefit in a free trade agreement? Yeah, it's basically these brands. I mean, that's, you know, I believe there are many things that America still has a lot of strength with. Certainly mm -hmm. technology, planes, breadbasket, but brands, like I mentioned before, this is a trade balancer. Mm -hmm. As long as, you know, we've done some damage to ourselves globally right. recently. Um, and, you know, America has this way of kind of stumbling its way through and then hopefully finally getting things right, you know, for, mm -hmm. a, for a time. But, you know, when I've traveled to all these different places, Everywhere I go, there's these, you know, American brands are prevalent. Mm -hmm. Even in a country like China, which, you know, the current administration considers us, I don't, enemies or whatever the case may right. be. You know, I'm traveling to real rural parts of China. There's Kentucky Fried Chickens, you yeah. know, there. And uh, there uh, Starbucks on quarters of every major city and Coca-Cola and Pepsi all the way through. And I think we have to recognize, uh, you know, this rhetoric that's going on. Mm -hmm. And the harm you know, that it can play. And the harm right? that it could potentially play. I think, you know, we have opened, we have provided an opportunity for a country like China to develop manufacturing, to support uh, sectors that we've walked away from or could mm -hmm. not support because of our labor, our labor costs. Um, 
and they've they've picked it up and done very, very mm-hmm. well with it. And they're a very important part of the fashion economy. They're anymore. an important part of a number of economies mm-hmm. that are existing for America. Um, they were our lifeline during COVID mm-hmm. with PPP and masks, et cetera. And so, you know, when we talk out of one hand that, that, that there are enemies, we can talk that they're another country. Mm-hmm. They're still human beings in, a, in the nature of an economy there are people that will want to build and build a robust economy and take advantage of whatever opportunities that are sitting there to build a better economy. And you can't blame them for that. We mm-hmm. probably as Americans have done that a number of times mm-hmm. over the, the number of decades. Um, and so there are things that w- we need to have checks and balances, you know, internationally. Certainly China has been... Um, has violated, you know, intellectual property right. uh, situations globally. But, you know, when we put all this kind of in a bucket and we think our solution is tariffs, right. I think it's, again, pretty faulted thinking, and it's certainly the numbers have borne that out. Right. Uh, you know, ultimately, with those tariffs, uh, you know, it's it's the consumer that ends up really suffering in right. the end, you know? Right. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think, I think very few people believed that China was going to pay the price for the tariff. The truth mm-hmm. is, is uh, this year we will have a higher trade imbalance with China than we've ever had before tariffs, 75 billion. Oh my gosh. Highest trade imbalance with China since 1981. So, when you say trade imbalance, right. what do you mean by that? So internationally, you know, um, we look at different countries and we manage trade balance, export versus import. Okay. So what are we exporting? What are they buying from us? And what are we buying from them? And ideally, there should be, in a simplified world, people think there should be a trade balance. Right. There's a lot of economists that say, hey, a trade imbalance to a degree actually benefits us, but we don't have time in this conversation to go through. But that is its nature, is that there is this there is this kind of number that says, hey, we're being fair with each other. Mm-hmm. We're exporting uh, grain, uh, food to China, and they're exporting to us uh, apparel, right. fashion, things like that. And so, um, among a number of other things. Uh, But I think when, you know, that's what I mean in terms of a trade balance. And so when there was this kind of position of fear put Mm -hmm. out with China and the solution, which every economist would tell you never works, is tariffs, you know, the result is, is that the American consumer paid more good paid more for goods that came in from China. Mm-hmm. And where did those dollars go? That what a lot of average citizens don't understand with tariffs is they think, because some of our politicians have said it is a it is a penalty against China, right? Right. That they're the ones that are paying. That, that. China's paying right. that, right? That's not the case. It when a good comes in from overseas. For a long time, we have had things called duties, and everyone mm-hmm. in our industry really understands what duties are. They're sure. a percentage of the cost of the garment that we pay the U.S. government to import those things. And a lot of those duties at one point were to balance trade, to okay. make things balanced, um, protecting domestic production. Today, it's an income stream for the government, right? Mm-hmm. It's a way to... Because we're into the certainly government. not trying, with, in the case of apparel, we're certainly not trying to protect our manufacturing yes, apparel. Yes, right. right. There's not a ton there, <laughs> yeah. right? And so, you know, tariffs are simply another layer of duty. So when we as an importer or brands as importers buy something from China, they come in, they pay the basic duty, then they pay an additional tariff, a penalty additional tax mm-hmm. uh, for importing those goods. Well, we as an importer or a brand or you know anyone else that's bringing goods into the country from China, they pay that to the government. But we have to maintain profitability, so prices go up to cover that cost that right. the government is now charging to import. And so ultimately, the U.S. consumer pays the penalty. Mm-hmm. Um, and in paying that penalty, those dollars flow through where? 
to the government. Right. So, you know, in this case, it's been faulted. The American consumers paid more. We in the apparel industry and the shoe industry Mm -hmm. um, have had higher costs for import. And the trade imbalance has gone up. Right. China has increased their volume of business uh, with us. So, which is only going to perpetuate some of these conversations that are flaming the fear mongering and certainly, all of these, right? Certainly. They're going to be more of a threat. Yeah. Human beings are human beings, mm-hmm. nations are just groups of human beings. Mm-hmm. So, there are things that nations will do even us against other nations that we would consider harmful if we were living in that other nation. So, you know, things like the G12, G8, you know, that mm-hmm. that entire group, I think those are a very effective means of deterrent in managing, uh, you know, international trade, et cetera. I know for a long time, China worked very, very hard to become members. Mm-hmm. And I think that, they put in place certain things that China needed to do to become a member. Such as? Internal monitoring. There were all mm-hmm. sorts of financial things going okay. on. I'm not a genius in that area, but I know that they. <laughs> it took them a number of years to come into compliance uh, so that they, become, they could become members. If China is unfairly doing a business practice against any other country, including the U.S., one of our options could have been, hey, there's intellectual property rights violations. You can threaten expulsion from from that. And so, you know, that could have been a more effective way. I think meeting human to human, Mm -hmm. having conversation. You know, the Chinese are deeply invested in the U.S., Mm-hmm. Uh, in our, you know, long-term bonds and and uh, U.S. businesses, etc. So there is this there is this unique balance that China has put on themselves mm-hmm. to not have America destroyed. So, you know, economically. So I think you know there are a lot of things we should really think about when we're walking down this road. I'm curious about learning a little more about some of these global initiatives that are in place to help kind of foster fair trade. Yeah. I think we were talking earlier today about TPP and... Yeah, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, you know, that that is an extension of an early agreement that was made between 12 nations. And when we think Trans-Pacific, we think, you know, they're all nations in Asia, which mm-hmm. isn't the case. I mean, Chile was a member, Peru was a member, Mexico, certainly United States, and then groups like Singapore, Vietnam, Malaysia, um, Australia, mm-hmm. New Zealand, 12 in total. Um, sorry if I left any nation <laughs> out in that deal, but, um, you know, Japan. that was a group, yeah, yeah that was Japan for sure. That was, a, that was an arrangement to help foster more open trade and reduce barriers to trade. And while there were different viewpoints on that, I felt like it put America in a really good position um, with these countries. And certainly in a geopolitical situation, we would become closer allies and trading partner with some of the newer members of that. But I think, you know, when in 2007, we had signed that in, I think, February 2016, and the current outgoing administration sort of abandoned it in 2017. And, you know, I think a lot of that was this rhetoric of fear and, you know, trade imbalance. And, and, uh, and I'm concerned that we walked away from something that would have given us strength in, that, in those regions with those countries. And now in the vacuum of us walking away, China's stepping right in uh, and considering becoming a member Mm-hmm. of the Trans-Pacific Partnership that we abandoned and really worked on uh, for a number of years. Do you think there's opportunity to get back? There's certainly always opportunity. The question is, is timing, desire, you know, I, I think that politicians have had a very, very loose, many politicians, not all, let me rephrase that, have had a very loose um term of facts lately. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's incumbent on on 
future administrations to really do the deep dives and really do their deep research and provide facts to you know, the American consumer about the benefits and the possible risks. In every business venture, there's risks and opportunities. And mm-hmm. I think in, in this one, that would be the case too. But I think we need to be engaged globally as the world, and that was an opportunity to do so. You know, a common thread in this conversation is that, you know, we are humans, you know, we're all interconnected, uh, even if just through humanity. Yeah. Um, but you've, you've had many stories of, you know, bringing people together from different cultures, different communities, different countries, yeah. and finding, um, you know, a great, great love and kinship and a capacity to work really, really well together in this industry. Yeah. And I'd love for you to share um, some insights of sure. some of the values there. Sure. I think, you know, we've talked about before that, you know, certainly lately, a lot of politics has been building walls, mm-hmm. right? And I think that at least in my experience with, I think, um, sound um, ethical business relationships where both parties sort of win, um, I think that helps to tear down walls. You know, I, you know, we, we hear on the news that Pakistan and India are at odds and enemies and, and uh, you know, that Muslims are against Christians and, you mm-hmm. know, religious factions, et cetera. And I remember a time uh, I spent three years um, working in some large factories in the north of Ethiopia. I mean, we were literally in the middle of nowhere. Uh, Adwa, and uh, and it was one of the largest facilities that I had ever worked in. It was fully vertical, um, uh, How many spinning. Uh, there were thirty two hundred workers on the floor. Okay. I think there were well over four thousand people um, in mm-hmm. the in the one particular factory in all sectors. So it okay. had spinning, weaving, knitting, dyeing, um, CM cutting, mm-hmm. you know, the whole works. And uh, they had brought in a consortium. The factory itself, the Ethiopian factory itself, were brought on a consortium of people from around the world to help in different areas. And then we, um, working on large projects there, had our individuals from different offices around the world. And, you know, there wasn't a bunch to do. So you worked long hours, and then you kind of walked about a mile and a half back to this compound that we would all hang out at in the evening. You know, and around the dinner table, you know, there was certainly, if we were political, <laughs> there was certainly an opportunity to have some pretty heated conversations. We had Indians, Pakistanis, Muslims, Christians, Jews, uh, Buddhists, um, you know, the kind works, all, walks, all, yeah. all walks of life yeah. from all different countries. All different economic backgrounds. Yeah, and I, and I couldn't help on some evenings kind of look around the table and I said, you know, if we were in some political arrangement or structure, this would be a really tough room, Mm -hmm. you know? And because we were all committed and working together uh, in our industry, um, trying to accomplish this common goal of exporting apparel, we really became brothers in arms. And I remember one one night it hit me extremely strongly that we had, uh, I had a guy good friend. He, we brought him over from the Korean office, James. And I think James was probably 60. He looked 30. He looked mm-hmm. really young and fit. And, and uh, we came back one night, we started eating and I think James had a low blood sugar issue and stood mm-hmm. up and then collapsed to the floor, passed out in sweat. And, you know, everyone was kind of shocked and, oh you know, yeah. we're in the middle of nowhere. So if it was going to be something serious, no that was anybody. not going to be good for James. Yeah. And, uh, but, but before anyone else could do anything, there were two guys uh, from Pakistan, Muslim uh, uh, religion, where in America we've been, you know, there's right. been a lot of rhetoric mm-hmm. uh, directed, unfortunately, toward um, Pakistan and, and Muslim faith and yeah. others. And, and uh, these two guys jumped up really quickly. They grabbed James. Now, James, you know, for, for the purposes of the conversation, He's an Asian Buddhist. Okay, right? right. So again, conflict among religion, maybe if we were in a political environment or whatever. But um, they grabbed him off the floor. 
They pulled him over to the couch. They recognized pretty quickly that he had, you know, just a low blood sugar issue. One quickly had someone run over a cold rag. They cradled him in in their laps and put a cold rag on his head. And they basically sang to him uh, for about an hour and a half or two hours. Oh and gosh. it was the most astounding view of care mm-hmm. that I had ever seen in kind of this camaraderie but business environment. And it struck me that, that, you know, the deficiencies we have when we listen to politicians that, some politicians, that, you know, if they can unite you against a common fear, mm-hmm. then they draw you closer to themselves because they're the salvation. And mm-hmm. in reality, we're human beings. And I think that, what I've seen over the years is that in my business, businesses can break down barriers that, that politics lately have created. And I think it's an important lesson to learn mm-hmm. that, that you know, our future and our responsibility as citizens of the earth is to create the synergies where we all thrive and get along because the, the, the choice uh, is probably not a good one if we can't sort that out. And I think we need yeah. to drive our politicians to understand that. Yes, as frustrating as our politics can be, we have to try as hard as we can to not let them interfere with kind of the better good, right? Yeah, yeah I, 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 I have hope that, that people are, are understanding of some of those things. But, you know, within America, one of the challenges that we've got is that we, as many Americans, don't travel a lot. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, they are naturally sort of centrically focused. They think that, that there aren't these kind of situations around the world that could impact them negatively. And I think really understanding, and, you know, I say I'm a globalist and people sometimes say, oh, that's a bad word. You know, people, you know, segment you as not, not being America-centric. I am America-centric. I believe that America is a great country, but the reality is is America is built of immigrants from all over the world. We cannot forget that we are a melting pot. And much like that, that story I told you about Ethiopia, that story in Ethiopia is an expanded version of what America, I mean, is a condensed version of what America is expanded today. Mm -hmm. I mean, Look around. Right. We have all these races and religions and backgrounds. You know, there isn't, quote, American. Mm-hmm. We, are, we are a melting pot of the rest of the world. And I think it's important for us using that awareness and understanding our history and background to continue to be a good steward and um, participant in the world. Yeah, I... I I completely agree with that. Um, and I also, uh, I kind of heard a hint when you were talking about traveling and yeah. of course now with, you know, COVID still being um, among us as it is today, you know, traveling isn't yeah. as practical, but once once we uh, are free to do that, do so again, I think travel is a really excellent way to introduce yourself to other parts of the world and trying to see things through a different lens. Yeah, and I think very quickly, these fears that people bring up, that there's a big bad world out there, mm-hmm. you know, and we kind of forget in our back, in our in our situation, we've got a lot of things that other nations look at and go, oh sure. my God, you know, look what's happening in America. Right. And I think if you get off and get on a plane and go start to experience the world, you'll find that people are people. Mm-hmm. They have families that they love and things that they care about. And there is good, bad, and ugly in every nation. Oh, absolutely. And uh, that it's not such a scary place. It can be a really fascinating place. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you very much. I um, appreciate a fascinating conversation in the dynamics of politics and fashion. This uh, very topic, you know, navigating the, the global si- supply chain and the complexities that, that come in line with that is something that we are really passionate about. Um, helping our clients and others in the industry navigate. So if we can be of any help to you, please feel free to reach out at Stars Design Group or at Clothing Culture. Mm-hmm.